Dr. Joseph Mercola is the world's visionary for natural health. He educates the public, he empowers consumers, he emboldens health professionals. Mercola.com is the largest natural health website by far. It rivals in size the WebMD and other establishment uh, websites. Dr. Mercola, as you know, stands up to the prescription drug barons, to the soft drink peddlers, to the fake food merchants, and they don't hesitate to strike back. A mes amis québécois, il y a aussi un website de Dr. Mercola en français. And not only is his website in French, it is in Spanish, and Chinese, and Japanese, and Russian. He wants to speak and does speak to the entire world, not just the Anglophone world. About our issue five years ago in Chicago, Dr. Mercola made a fateful, fateful in the best sense of the word, decision that he would give particularized attention to particularized causes and our cause thank goodness was chosen as one of those and he decided to work with consumers for dental choice and with his chief of staff Steve Rye and they provided us uh, strategic advice technical expertise uh, publicity all the tools that he has so assiduously developed and that includes six figures of dollars for six straight years and six figures plus not only the hundred thousand but also beyond the match he provides special grants for special purposes for our worldwide work uh, I'm happy to announce that the consumers for dental choice did make the match did raise a hundred thousand dollars and that will be matched by dr. Mercola um, and thank you dozens does dozens of you literally dozens of you in this room were uh, uh, con uh, donated and we thank you all these there have been some Sensational results in six years which are now self-evident starting with the mainstreaming of mercury free dentistry you are in the mainstream if you're a mercury free dentist the pro mercury dentists are a dwindling group of, of, uh, of uh, basically primitive practitioners and they are fading out we also can point with pride to the Minamata Convention on Mercury signed by over a hundred nations and I assure you getting amalgam into that convention was difficult. It was not in when we started. We got it in. They knocked it out at a meeting in Tokyo. We got it in. They knocked it back out at a meeting in Montevideo. We got it back in to stay in the end. It not only is in the treaty, but it has, it has a road map for how countries can and must reduce amalgam use, and it has a procedure by which we can seek the total ban on mercury amalgam worldwide. But yes, it does. It's great. It's great. Great, thank you. Next month in Brussels, the European Parliament will make its, it will start deciding the fate of amalgam for all of the European Union, the third largest jurisdiction in the world, the U.S. is fourth. They are going to make a law on all of the Minamata Convention and there are a series of amendments to consider addressing exactly what to do with amalgam. Some very good amendments. We are working closely. Our campaign, and I run the, I'm president of the World Alliance for Mercury free dentistry. We have affiliates in all the major European Union nations. They're all coming to Brussels. I'm going to Brussels. We can make that happen. As for the, and we, yes, if we've got Europeans, thank you. As for the first and second largest nations in the world, I spent a week in India in June, and I will spend a week in Beijing, China in October working for mercury free dentistry in the two largest nations. I've been to 24 nations working for mercury free dentistry, and I, I, I obviously the most important one is the one I'm standing in right now. Our goal is under the demand your choice campaign and some of you know about it you've been reading about it maybe most of you but we need your help we need to persuade the consumers of America to demand mercury free dentistry from their insurance companies demand equality if they're on Medicaid or Indian reservations or VA or soldiers or sailors same thing we need the consumers to stand up you can help them you can help them with our demand your choice website and you can promote it we've got an app if that would help your brand we've got an app Facebook, Twitter, all those things on demandyourchoice.com. 
For my Canadian uh, colleagues, uh, we're going to have a breakfast tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock of Canadian dentists and dental hygienists in the big breakfast area on this floor in the very back left by the window. All Canadians who are here are invited. You know that Dr. Mercola, and, and speaking of tables, where that table is, Dr. Mercola is putting bread on your table. And let, 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 I think we realize that and need to realize that because he wants consumers to go, and so do I, to mercury-free dentists only. Mercury-free dentistry from a pro-mercury dentist is a, t a terrible idea because the next, at the next chair over, a few minutes later, they, they're gonna, the guy's going to, the woman's going to put mercury in a child's mouth. So all, every consumer dollar should be spent on mercury-free dentists, and you see that in his articles when he promotes all of these organizations, the academies, IBDM, IOMT, Holistic Dental, uh, Tom McGuire's Wellness for You, Talk International, Huggins Applied Healing, DAMS, our Consumers for Dental Choice, all are listed in his articles because he wants people to go to mercury-free dentists, and we obviously know that benefits you, but much more important, it benefits the consumer, the environment the workers, everybody. More than any, more than any person in the last decade, doctor, last two decades, Dr. Mercola has united the movement for mercury-free dentistry. The internal effect has been fantastic. We are united, and I make the, the pitch to you to stay united and don't let Dr. Mercola down. One of the reasons he succeeds so well is he is an absolutely exceptional writer. You see that in the book Effortless Healing. You see it in his articles. The writing is one of the reasons he has such impact. So it's my pride and joy to present to you this excellent writer, this pioneer in natural health, and this great American, Dr. Joseph Mercola. Hey, thanks, Charlie. Hey, thanks, everyone. Is it, on? Is it on? Oh, I might have to turn my mic on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. I greatly appreciate it. And thank Charlie for his kind words. And we were able to actually make a difference. We really are. But it's not because of me. It's because of the whole team and all of you and the magnificent work that Charlie does. I mean, I'm just so grateful. that you chose to identify the truth and follow that, even though it means many times criticism from your colleagues, because this mercury is a pernicious poison, as you know. And I can tell people and warn them about it, but if they, you know, they, they, and I warn them, but not make the mistake that I did when I had my mercury fillings removed after I watched an episode of 60 Minutes and went to my local dentist who was on the board of elders of the church I went to, and he had to be a good guy, right? But I didn't know what the heck he was doing. And he caused me health problems. So I don't want anyone to ever make that mistake. And, I, and we couldn't do it if we didn't have people like you out there doing it. So thank you so much. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about Charlie's work. He probably just expand on what he already said. It's been around for 20 years. It's your 20th year anniversary, Charlie, right? So congratulations. <laughs> you know that? that was a young Charlie. <laughs> or younger, and another young Charlie. So, you know, basically, if you probably know, but I'm just going to remind you that in the 90s, dentists lost their license for practicing mercury in dentistry, and Charlie was largely responsible for that, eliminating that gag order and telling people about that, that mercury, their amalgam fillings had mercury in them. So congratulations on doing that, Charlie. Appreciate that. And, you know, as Charlie mentioned five years ago, we got together with in Chicago, and we... You know, the, the website was successful and I started generating excess income that I didn't need so I wanted to put it, invest it back into serving my purpose which is to help people get healthy so one of those was, was Mercury and probably he's been the most successful of all the people we've invested in because of what he's been able to do and accomplish I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what he's doing and 
a lot of the legwork is, is there to, to eliminate mercury because it's great that you're out there as a resource taking the mercury out. But if someone keeps on putting it back in, we're going to need the multiple rooms of this for decades to come. And that's just crazy. You have to stop, you know, we have to have practice preventive medicine. So Charlie mentioned the Minamata Convention. He travels around the world to get this UN treaty passed, plug amalgam in so he can get banned, and he's still working on that. And it's not just the United States. He's international. He goes five to six countries every year or more. I don't know how he does it, but he does. So it's this worldwide international collaboration. He's from the grassroots. He's getting the people in these, like Ethiopia. Is it Ethiopia or Bangladesh? You know, they're, they're just eliminating mercury out of the whole system. And interestingly now, we can see that in the last eight years, there's been an almost doubling of the number of people who understand that amalgam fillings are actually mercury, which is great progress, and, and largely as a response, response to uh, well, what Charlie's doing, and your, and your groups too, of course. So there's a lot more mercury-free dentists. You know, there was 2% when Charlie started, and now there's over half the dentists in the, in the country are mercury-free, which is exactly where we want to go. But still too high. We've got a lot more work to do. And that's why we're starting a new campaign, Demand Your Choice, I believe is the name of it. And how many people here, and I want to raise the hands, please, would be interested in having non-amalgam fillings as an alternative on the dental insurance programs that your patients have. Who would be interested in that? You think that would help? All right, I think it would help too. That's what the plan is. And I've got the most visited natural health site in the world I have for 11 years now, or 12 years. And we know how to market. We know how to carry a message. We, it's, it's res ipsa loquitur. The facts speak for themselves. We can, we're effective at it. And we just target certain areas. And this is one that we're targeting. We're going to put a lot of effective strategies behind this to accomplish this goal. And the whole goal is to change a dental insurance. So for a campaign, what's that campaign? It's just the change, wait, what's the name of it, Charlie? Is change, demand change, demand your change. Now, that, you know, I also funded uh, actually a lot more money to, for the GMO labeling initiative in California. And we did, and we lost, though, but we actually were winning the war because we increased consciousness about that. And when we first started that five years ago, no one knew hardly what a GMO was. Now they know. And we lost in a few states, but we did a very specific strategic uh, initiative in that we understood what the key words that people and the consumers wanted. And that's what Charlie's done with this. So that the demand your choice is, are three very effective words that's going to have a massive impact. And... We figure that it's going to take $100,000 to do this, $100,000. And I think we can do, with that amount of money, we can um, mount the massive social media campaigns and the networks, because obviously we use it my site, but we're networked with a lot of other sites, to, to start to catalyze this movement. So... Um, I've donated well over a million dollars to Charlie's organization in the last five years. And I'm going to donate more because I think he's doing a great job. And I just want to tell you, because you, know, you have to be really a frugal steward of your resources. And I don't know anyone, any organization, that's more frugal than Charlie. <laughs> So that means you are absolutely leveraging. None of this is going to crazy overhead that someone's stealing behind your back. Charlie walks instead of taking a taxi. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He's like a mile away from our first meeting. He's took a, he walked. I mean, maybe it's two miles. That was crazy. I mean, he's just, he's so diligent. He won't waste a penny. It's a 
Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I support him. But my donating this, do, do I benefit in any financially in any way? No. I'm not a dentist. I don't sell dental materials. I don't sell dental supplements. You are the guys that's going to benefit. And we, you know, we, I'm sure, how many people have gotten patients from my site? If you haven't, that's pretty crazy. You were not asking then. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Uh, so you're going to benefit from this. So when that financial incentive disappears, because a lot of patients, you know, they're financially strapped and they, won't, they don't have the capacity to go outside their insurance program. So if their insurance covers that, then you're going to gain. So what I'm asking, and I know a lot of you have been exemplary, because all, you know, all that money that I've matched for Charlie, it's been matched by you guys. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, but you know, I'm just coming to the table one more time to ask for another, it's not 100, we just have to split it. So if you guys donate 50, I'll donate 50 to get this done. How does that sound? Sound like a deal? So if you've been sitting on the fence, now's the time to get off the fence and then help Charlie do his job so he can get this thing done because this man's on a mission. You know, he was a former state's attorney for West Virginia and he uses his political ties and networks to get things done. He really, he really knows the inside loops. So demand your choice. I should put it up front. That's it. I just have a challenge with that. So... Uh, I have a great passion for dentistry because some of my earliest mentors in my transition from traditional medicine to natural medicine were very wisely attuned to the connection between dentistry and health. And my first mentor was uh, Tom Stone, who unfortunately didn't understand that his electrodermal screening and homeopathic remedies are not enough to overcome type, 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 type 2 diabetes. Uh, and uh, but he he introduced me to Doug Cook. People, I'm sure people know Doug, who Doug Cook is, and he was my first biological dentist, and he really changed my life. And and uh, I've only been seeing biological dentists since then. But of course, there's other great dentists. All, I mean, all of you are great dentists. But so there's some pioneers like George Meinig and Hal Huggins and Weston Price, of course. So and they've helped identify the incredible connection between dental health and regular physical health. And you know, I don't have to preach to you because you guys are experts on it. And I'm not going to try to explain the things that you that like you likely know more than me on. So what I'm going to talk about is my passion, which is nutrition or being healthy. And you know, one of the things that we do when I realized, and one of the re reasons that I went down and we supported Charlie and, and our other partners in our health liberty initiatives was because. If we realize that if there were barriers, we could educate people till the cows come home, and they would know about it. If they did, but if the barriers to implementing those healthy practices weren't removed, it would be very difficult to get better. Like not labeling GMOs and not understanding that 90% of the food in your grocery store is contaminated with a toxic herbicide that makes DDT look like uh, pumpkin pie. So you know, so we expose these threats. But my new passion, because I think it's so foundational and fundamental, and it's one of the reasons why you're probably wondering, what the heck is he wearing those darn glasses for? But, did you wonder that? Anyone wonder that? <laughs> like Bob? No. Actually, does he wear the same? I, I, I didn't realize that. But no, these are what's called reverse sunglasses. I only wear them inside, under alien suns. And I'll tell you about that in a bit, just to keep the surprise up. But it, it has to do with improving mitochondrial health. So, did anyone ever hear the story that doctors are the third leading cause of death? Who heard that? Anyone? Most of you, right? You know who made that headline up? I did. I never got credit for it, though, but I was reading when I did got the printed the version of JAMA in July of 2000, and Barbara Starfield wrote an article that didn't say that, but the, if you just read it, it the, the statistics screamed it out. And doctors 
were the third leading cause of death, at least according to her stats. And she's an MD, PhD out of Stanford, and her husband's an MD, PhD. And that was in 2000, July of 2000. And the British Medical Journal earlier this year said the same thing 15 years later. But you know what's an interesting irony? Barbara Starfield died from a medical error. She took an antiplatelet drug, Plavix, I believe, and it killed her. So, you know, that, I mean, the third, if you think about it, I really don't think it's a third. I think the whole medical system is the leading cause of death. It really is, because they don't understand the truth about health. And, you know, you could practice the best dentistry around, but if you don't apply these biological principles, it's like the law of gravity. It doesn't matter what you know, who you know, how much you earn, what status or prestige you have, it's going to hit you hard. And you're not going to be able to, to fill your life's goals and you're, and you're going to be crippled with, health, with chronic health problems. So what I'd like to do today is share with you some simple principles because health has been my passion for decades. And that's all I do full time now. I don't, I delegate a lot of the writing, I do all of the editing, and I write the books, but I'm really exploring all these alternative strategies that people don't have the time to do. I'm reading studies. I read, read 150 books a year. I read thousands of studies a year just to, to, to glean these principles. Oh, 700 deaths every day. Now, uh, part of this is a rotten rotten food. And it's like impossible almost, not impossible, but almost impossible because obviously many of you are in areas where the, you have identified healthy restaurants, but most restaurants don't serve healthy food. I mean, you can be guaranteed it's gonna be challenged in a whole variety of ways. So the, the, this graph just illustrates that that increase, it's increasing, the amount of food that we're eating is increasing as time goes on. So I've said a lot of nasty stuff, right? But I don't want you to worry. I don't want you to worry because there is light at the end of the tunnel. Because <laughs> you can take control of your health. So why do you get sick? Lots of different reasons, and there's probably more than these too. Of course, we can integrate the dental health, but I mean, if you have a dental problem, it's usually due to some of these issues going on here because, you know, it's con contributes to the, it's, everything's connected. But one of the key principles is to eat real food. And it's simple. Michael Pollan has it. He's real food and. And uh, most, his, he expands on that mostly vegetables and not that much and not that often. So, but the devil is in the details. And I just want to go over some of them so we, we can remind you because vegetables are healthy, right? Of course. But if you have not so much GMO, because there's not many GMO vegetables. I mean, there's grains and corn and soy. But not many GMO vegetables out there that were, they're growing. But nevertheless, when you're industrially farming food, uh, those practices not only decimate the topsoil, which were projections now we're expected to lose in the next two generations, there'll be no topsoil to grow food because of these industrial farming practices. But it also depletes it of minerals, and it also they apply these toxic chemicals on there and. They get, they get into your system. So yes, you need to eat vegetables, but you have to be careful that they're healthy, organic, ideally locally grown, and even growing them yourself would be the best. CAFO meat is another thing, you know, confined animal feeding operations. Um, I think we all need some animal protein. Maybe some people don't need meat. You don't absolutely have to have meat, but, small, but you do need animal protein, and animals would be defined as fish or, or poultry, but it's got to be clean. You have to raise it clean because if you feed them crap, it's going to obviously get concentrated and you're going to consume it and it'll get into your body. And farm fish is a great example. It's a, it's a really a tragic example because in my view, seafood is probably the single healthiest food in the world. And I'll tell you why in a few moments. So they've taken, because of industrial pollution, 
mercury, primarily for burning coal, not although amalgams are an issue, but it's primarily for burning coal and raining down into the waterways and eventually depositing into the oceans and then get bioaccumulated into bigger and bigger fish. And then all the other toxic poisons like, like dioxins and P P PCBs and PBDs, they all get concentrated. And then, so that's for the large fish, but for the farm fish, People don't realize, I was just sitting next to a guy in the plane yesterday, coming up, smart guy, an engineer from the University of Georgia. He had no idea. He had no idea that farm fish, what was the difference was. But I, I, I'm sure you do, I told him. They feed farm fish, GMO corn, GMO soy, full of pesticides. And why is wild Atlantic salmon, wild Alaskan salmon so healthy for you? Because they're eating either the algae directly or indirectly from other fish or, or, or seafood that has consumed it. Because that's where these healthy fats are in the microalgae. And farm fish has virtually none of that. Now this is one of my mentors, Ron Rosedale, who I met about 21 years ago, helped me understand um, really one of the most foundational basics of health. And I hope each and every one of you can really apply this, because this changed my entire practice. He helped me understand that insulin resistance, insulin receptor sensitivity, is one of the most profoundly important biological variables to control. And I'm going to expand on that, because he's, this was 21 years ago. His vision, this guy is a genius. And... Uh, it's expanded that into details I'll talk about in a few minutes. But that's a key issue, and it kind of bears on, and I've known this for 20 years, but only in the last year or two have I really started to fully, deeply appreciate the details. Remember, the devil is in the details, and that's what I'm going to explain to you. So I used to live in Chicago, in fact, not too far from Dr. Stopka's office. I knew her when I was living there and practicing, and I realized... Why am I living here? So I moved to Florida so I can get some more sunshine. So I walk on the beach every day for about two to three hours while I read, and that's why I'm reading 150 books. The best book I read last year was this book, Tripping Over the Truth. Does anyone either have cancer or know someone who has cancer? Then I would highly recommend you get this book. This will blow the lid off the conventional cancer model, which believes that cancer is a somatic, somatic mutation. It is, it is, I mean, there's, there's mutations in the DNA in the nucleus, but that's not the cause. That's the secondary side effect. It's a magnificent story. I mean, it, it literally changed my life. And I thought I did, wasn't aware of this, but the way he put it together, he's a magnificent writer. And you'll find, and you, if you don't know this already, that 1,600 people are going to die today in the United States from cancer. And my contention is the vast majority of those, 80, 90, 95%, didn't have to die. Cancer was a very rare disease not too long ago. A very rare disease. Now there's a lot of reasons for this. It's not one magic bullet that, that's going to fix this. But what I'm going to explain to you will be the principles on how to essentially immunize each and every one of your cells, your family members, and your friends against ever having to struggle with this issue. Would you like that? Would you like to know that? Okay, I know you know some of these principles, but some of them you don't, I can assure you. It all about, what, what Travis does in his book is review, help you understand how mitochondria are the central role, the, the, the foundation. If you, you Really, if you get healthy mitochondria, you're going to get healthy. And we all know, right? They make ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. And how do they make it? They make it by getting electrons, right? It's actually more complicated than we're talking about, but well, where do those electrons come from? They come from carbs and fat. And they pass these electrons through the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
and they ultimately deposited to oxygen the ultimate electron acceptor. And when they do that, because of these transfers, ATP gets generated. Actually, they do it by protons being pumped out and then, then uh, uh, causing the ATP synthetase to generate the ATPs. That's what most people understand. That most people know this, okay? What most people don't know, and I suspect many of you are unaware of, that's not the only role they play. They're not just the energy powerhouses of the cell. They're the epigenetic controllers of the DNA of the nucleus. And how do they do that? They do that from a variety of ways. Cell death, autophagy, you've heard of that, right? That's the mechanism that your body has to repair and regenerate. When you have sick, senescent old cells, there's a mechanism is, it, that's initiated through the mitochondria that causes autophagy to occur. And there's, sub, there's sub-metabolic processes that catalyze this. We'll talk about it a bit. But the other thing is that it's incredibly potent cell signaling, and it signals right to the nucleus. It's an epigenetic regulator. So the key is to improve to the max your mitochondrial function. You want to do everything you can to improve that. So what is going to cause damage from a biochemical perspective to the mitochondria? It's reactive oxygen species, an unpaired electron. You see, when you... As I just described earlier, as your body breaks, the, you know, there is no, uh, well, your body takes those electrons from the digested fat, hopefully, but in most people, almost everyone in your practice, it is taking it from carbohydrate. And it transfers those electrons ultimately to oxygen. But if, depending on which fuel you're using, anywhere from 1% to 10% of those electron transfers will not go to oxygen. They will take a shortcut, which goes to superoxide, then to hydrogen peroxide, and then to hydroxyl free radical, which is the most potent reactive oxygen species we know. We know it's also the most short-lived, but that decimates mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial proteins, mitochondrial membranes, and essentially prematurely kills your mitochondria. So we're all told that they're bad, right? We, we don't need reactive oxygen. Let's get rid of all the reactive oxygen species. Uh, let's use antioxidants. Do you think, who thinks that's a good idea, using antioxidants? No one? No one thinks antioxidants is a good idea? Balance. Who said that? That was perfect. That was it. That's, it's balance is the key. Because if you take antioxidants, it's well proven. I mean, that was the, the, I mean these reactive oxygen species were, were, weren't known about too long ago. I mean, this is, it was in the 50s. And you know, that was the free radical theory of aging. But excessive reactive ROS is, is a problem. But you need ROS. You need them. If you didn't have them, because that's the way your body works. That's a very power, they're very powerful signaling mechanism. I can give you an example of that. Because the reason I'm wearing these glasses is blocking blue light. Because the blue light from these lights is not coming at the right time. And it's, it's mostly blue. It's digital. Typically, these may be analog. I, I, I can't tell. Are these incandescents? or fluorescence. But most likely, I don't care. I'm just taking a, I'm, I'm careful. I'm not playing games with this. This is real. So that blue light with unopposed red light will generate reactive oxygen species in not only in your retinal pigment of pigmented epithelium, but also in your mitochondria. However, if you don't get that blue light, well, ideally with the sun in the morning, you will massively disrupt your circadian rhythm. And that blue light, but the, the, the sun in the morning, you're preceded with red light. Red light comes first, then it gets brighter. And the red light causes repair and regenerative re- mechanisms. And then the, the blue light f- will cause reactive oxygen species that simulates a beneficial signal that causes to optimize your mitochondria and in your melatonin production. But let's talk about lowering unnecessary ROS, which causes all the problems. I think no one would disagree with that. We want to lower that. So this is one of the most powerful ways to do that is iron. Who 
what are the guesses of the, of the reasons why women, premenopausal women, typically live longer than men at that same age or have less heart attacks and less heart disease? What do you think? What? They're skiing? Menses. That's right. Menses is losing the iron. That's it. That's the key. Losing the iron. And that's what, because when I graduated med school, the, the prevailing theory was that it was hormones. I got so enamored with this concept that I w was fond of estrogen replacement therapy, not bioidentical, <laughs> Premarin and Provera. That, and I was speaking back at the time, and then some of the drug companies that would actually hire me and fly me to places like this to, to lecture about estrogen replacement therapy. So I was a paid speaker for the drug companies. Back then, not anymore. But anyway, iron is toxic because if we go back to that system where you've got this chain coming down where the reactive oxygen species, the iron, if it's high, it will catalyze the conversion of the hydroxide to, or I'm sorry, the peroxide to the hydroxyl free radical. So what's high? The best blood test is a serum ferritin. And ideally, it should be 40 to 60. It's interesting when they do studies. There's a really interesting book. It's called Dumping Iron. It goes into this really carefully. It was just written this book this year. Uh, that when they do studies of people who donate their blood, those who donate their blood two to three years have dramatically lower risk of cancer and heart disease. Why? Because they're lowering iron and they're lowering their reactive oxygen species. So ideally, you should get this thing done. If it, I would assure you that unless you're a premenopausal woman or you've had some chronic GI bleed, it's likely that you are at least over 100, probably closer to 170. And there are many people in this room who are over 300. And it is just like pushing the gas or the accelerator, because I have a Tesla, so I don't have a gas pedal, I have an accelerator. Pushing the accelerator on aging and death, premature death. So if it's high, it's the simplest, there's no supplement, there's no exercise, you just have to donate your blood. Now, since you're all licensed healthcare professionals, and probably most of you can start IVs, you don't have to do this. You could do it like, like yourself. You could actually get a butterfly catheter and just suck out like a few ounces because 16 ounces of blood is a lot of blood. It's going to take you out for a little bit. So I, I take out four ounces once every six weeks. I do it myself until my ferritin level is normal. You could also take vitamin C. You have to be careful with vitamin C because vitamin C, if you're taking it with like meat and things, it will increase iron absorption where calcium will inhibit it. So if you're taking a calcium supplement, take it with food that has iron in it, like meat. You, most of us don't need iron. If you're a premenopausal woman or you're a child, then that would be different because many in, in that group are deficient and they do need it. It is, you need it, but you don't need excessive amounts. So, this is available fuel in our bodies. Most of you know this. We have very little carbohydrate, about 5%, uh, and it's stored as glycogen in our muscle and our liver, and the rest of it is fat. And most people in this country, you know, we have two-thirds of the people in the U.S. are overweight, and another third or 40% in some states or more are obese. And it wasn't always like this. I mean, 20 years ago, statistics, there, there was not one state in the U.S. who had 20% of their population that were obese. Everyone was under 20 Now, there's not one state in the U.S. that is below 20% obesity. So it's growing. It's all due to insulin resistance. That's the key. It's insulin resistance. And, and so that's what we want to treat. But insulin resistance encompasses a wide story. So wouldn't it make sense to have the ability to burn fat? The problem is when you're eating carbohydrates continuously on a regular basis in large amounts, your body has no need for fat stores because you need fuel. You're either going to get from carbs or you're going to get it from fat. 
So if it doesn't, if it doesn't need the access to fat, it shuts down the enzymes to do it. So when you shift your body into fat burning mode, you also help it to do not only treat cancer to improve mitochondrial function, but also anti-aging, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS, uh, seizure disorders. And part of the process, when your body starts to burn fat, you generate ketones. And ketones got a bad rap because of diabetes and diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA. But there is a world of difference between DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and nutritional ketosis. The difference is, I mean, in both, the, the ketones are elevated, but in a DKA, they are like four, the ketones are like 40 millimoles. And it's virtually, it's almost impossible to go over eight in nutritional ketosis. But the other big thing is that the blood sugar in nutritional ketosis is very, very low. Typically, it's under 70, 60, 50 milligrams per decilitre, whereas in DKA, it's two, three, four, five hundred. So there's two different clinical studies, and people can... Confuse this. Even respected scientists don't understand this. It's not dangerous. These ketones are produced in your liver. And here's the key point. You're going to burn fuel. You have to burn fuel or you'll be dead. So you're going to be either burning carbs or, or fat. Here's the key. Fat burns cleaner. It's a cleaner fuel. It has less pollution. They produce much less reactive oxygen species. So, how do you get to burn fat? Well, one of the ways is you have to lower your carbohydrate intake. And net carbs is a term we use to describe the total carbohydrate minus the fiber. So, you might have a, a food with a lot of carbohydrate in it. I'm thinking one. Well, like psyllium, which is an interesting. That's an extreme. Psyllium husk. So you could take 100 grams of psyllium husk, which is a fiber, and it would be 100 grams of carbohydrate. But psyllium happens to be 100 grams of fiber. So the net carbs on three ounces of psyllium is zero. Or you could have food like sugar, which is 100%. So it's, that's the exact converse. So low net carbs, which means no grains, starchy vegetables, unlimited, very limited fruit, and unlimited green vegetables typically because they are very small amounts. It's almost impossible to eat more than 40 grams if you're just eating vegetables because they just don't have a lot of... It's mostly fiber. Unless, unless there's a starch you got, like potatoes or corn or those types of things. So Atkins was popularizing this in the 70s and he did a great job at raising awareness of this concept and many people were useful. useful. But this, this approach now has been revised substantially and it's significantly different in that um, he didn't focus, I mean he had the low carbs, but he didn't focus on the quality of the food or the fact that protein is, is dangerous in, in excessive amounts. High protein is definitely a problem. Absent, Atkins had no clue because he died in 2004 which is interesting. That was the year my first book came out, and we made the transition. He, he had the number one website in the world in health, and I had, it was number two, and then when he passed away, then I, I took over that position. But he, he didn't, there's this, how many people have heard of this, comp, this pathway, metabolic signaling pathway? Let me see your hands. There's a few of you, but not many. He didn't know about this because this pathway was discovered just a few years before he died. It was primarily in research. It's short for mammalian target of rapamycin. Rapamycin is an oncology drug and it was discovered through some oncology research. Now they changed the name. It's me mechanistic tor uh, target of rap rapamycin. But it's, it's one of the most important signaling pathways in your body. Very ancient pathway, even though we've only known about it for a few years. And it's present in most other species. And 
the danger of an Atkins approach, and most people who te seek to implement nutritional ketosis, like primal eating or paleo, is that they don't understand the excessive dangers of protein. And my mentor, Ron Rosedale, who I showed you earlier, helped me understand this, but even I didn't believe him for like seven years. And, and I, now I'm convinced that what he's saying was true, that excess protein, excess protein is more dangerous than excess carbs. Now, you can say, well, I'm doing, what am I going to do when I'm lifting weights and want to build, build muscle mass, right? Well, you have a choice. You can optimize for performance in bodybuilders, or you can optimize for longevity. You can't do both at the same time. I think that's one of the reasons why Jack LaLanne died. I mean, he died in his 90s, admittedly. And he had a really good diet. He was basically a vegetarian. And my understanding, my belief as to why most vegetarians are pretty healthy, not all, of course, and I don't believe, I'm not, I don't believe anyone should be a vegan. I think we all need animal protein. But vegetarians are generally healthier. You know why, why I think they're healthier? They have less protein. There's not a lot of protein in vegetables. They do a lot of other things that are, that, 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 the biggest problem with vegetarians is they don't get this fat that we're going to talk about in a bit. But this mTOR pathway is a nutrient signaling pathway, and it is the one that's responsible for autophagy in the mitochondria. So when you have protein, primarily branched-chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and that causes to catalyze or activate mTOR. Very similar to when you eat carbohydrates, how your insulin level goes up, right? Because you have to digest it, or metabolize it would be a better term. So it's similar when you have protein, mTOR goes up. So when mTOR goes up, autophagy goes down, your risk for cancer goes up. And it also decreases mitochondrial biogenesis. Now, I'll bet, how many, how many, how many cells do we have in our body? A lot. How many? 100 trillion, the, the new revision is about 35 trillion. And then probably as many, and we, we used to think there was as many, 10 times as many bugs in our gut, but there's not really. It's actually about the same, especially when you take a poop. You know, I mean, it's like you've dumped almost 90% of them out in your gut. So they're about the same, but the mitochondria, it's like, I think it's between three and 500 quadrillion mitochondria, because almost every cell in your body has them. And some of the cells, especially the metabolically active ones like your like your heart and your brain, they have really dense amounts. So if they're damaged, they need to be repaired. And if you impair, impair the body's ability to regenerate the mitochondrial, mitochondrial biogenesis, you're in a bad place. So the key is to limit protein. This is, this is Rosedale's recommendation, and I, I think it's true for most of us. It doesn't mean you have to do it all the time. If you want to integrate some strength training into your exercise program, I think that's fine, especially if you're younger. Then you can go a little higher, maybe even double, or not that much, maybe 50% more. But just for that day, and you're not strength training every day. So it's a gram per kilogram of lean body mass. What does that amount to? That's 40 to 70 grams for most of us. Now that's not 40 to 70 grams of chicken or beef. Obviously, you have to put that in some nutrient tracker to figure how much that, that is. Like an egg has less than seven grams of protein. So it could be 10, 10 eggs for a day if that was your only source, but obviously it's not. So it's not, I mean, it, it, you know, if you're smaller and you have less lean body mass and you don't need as much. I typically go about 60 grams, six, between 60 and 70. Don't you love this pathway? I love it. And I have a pointer here, if I can see this. They told me if I point on a slide, it won't work. my notebook didn't work, so I got a point over here. Uh, that's the mTOR pathway. And you can see it's controlled by other, other hormonal pathways like insulin and leptin and IGF. And those, when those are high, that will activate them. When those are low, it decreases. And it works in conjunction with AMPK, which is another very powerful component. So if mTOR is high, then AMPK is low. And you want AMPK to high, because if you look down, the, down here at the end, you're going to live long when you have activated AMPK, and you die early when you, when you have mTOR activated all the time. It's just the way 
the cookie crumbles. So these nutrient sensitive pathways are absolutely critical. So does anyone have flex oil at home? Okay, uh, put your hand high. High. Oh my God. Like this is biochemistry 101. What I, first, what I want you to do, if you're, said, if you're taking, if you're not taking notes, and take notes. The people who raised your hand, please, and those who are embarrassed to raise your hand, please take notes on this. If you have flax oil, or you know someone that has flax oil, make a commitment to to donate that flax oil to one of your neighbors or family members that you don't like. Okay? Promise me. Or you can throw it away, which would probably be the kindest thing to do. Do you need omega-3? Of course. Why on earth would anyone, after knowing what I'm going to share with you in a few months, ever decide to take flax oil? Why don't you want to take flax oil? Now, I'm not opposed to flax seeds or the oil within flax seeds. I have a tablespoon of flax seeds every day. I soak them organic, they're organic, and I soak them overnight, and I have them in my smoothie, and I'll show you in a moment. I think we all need healthy forms of ALA, which is not just in flax seeds. Flax seeds is the most common. It's also in chia and hemp and other vegetable sources. But when you extract it, this is one of the reasons why most people are getting sick. I mean, I don't have a lot of kind words for Ansel Keys, who was a very prominent researcher in the 50s. He didn't live to be in his 90s. I mean, he had some things right, but he was funded by the sugar industry. But he correctly identified that there was an epidemic of heart disease in the 50s. And he, you know, Keys, if you don't know, was the guy who prompted the action to have a low-fat diet, which got promulgated through the Senate Dietary Guidelines in the 70s and 80s, actually 1980, and the McGovern Committee, which literally killed probably over 100 million people prematurely, maybe 200 million people. But he was responding to something that was correct. What he noticed is that there was, heart disease didn't exist hardly in the 1800s. It was so rare. If you were in a medical school, in a teaching school, that, you know, they gather the students and gather, and you'll never see this in your life. This guy's got a heart disease, a heart attack. You know, it just doesn't happen. So what happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was that we, as the industrial age happened, we developed the capacity to mechanically remove oil from seeds. And when you do that, that is the, that is the crux of the problem. Now, most of them are not omega-3 oils like flax. Most of them are omega-6, which is even worse. And now, you know, pa past the 1950s and especially past 1990, you've got to add glyphosate and Roundup and all these other toxic herbicides um, into the equation. So not only do you get these oxidized oils, excessive amounts of omega-6, you get all the, pe the, pe the, the, the toxic chemicals you don't need. So the problem with omega-3 as your primary, you need omega-3. It is, in my view, the single most important nutrient you need. And I'm going to tell you how to get it in a moment. But I'm going to go over vegetable fats for fuel first. Because if you're going to have low carb, like I just suggested, and you're going to have low protein, what's left? Fat, right? And if you're making the mistake of using that flax oil, you're going to go from bad to worse. It's like that, that term that I'll never forget. I think it was Hal Huggins' book, From the Frying Pan to the Fire. You know? That's where, that's where you're going. I think that was the title of one of the books. So here's, here's the healthy vegetable fats, avocados. I have three avocados a day. Coconut oil, MCT oil, which is short for medium chain triglycerides, which are extracted from coconuts. Uh, raw cacao butter, many of you probably haven't heard of that, but that's what they make chocolate of. It's really good and very dense, it's almost all fat. Nuts and seeds, but not a lot of the seeds because they're high in omega-6. But the macadamias are probably the best uh, they have the highest amount of fat, lowest amount of protein, lowest amount of carbs. And then pecans follow short behind that. 
Oops, wrong direction. And the animal fats would be pastured animals, um, which are the best way, you know, the, the way they were designed to be raised by nature in the fields, not be given all these grains that disrupts. The, the cows were not designed to eat grains. Uh, I took another slide for time reasons, but you know, a cow eats grass, right? Right. They're not. They're not supposed to eat grains. When they eat grass, what's that grass converted to? Is it di is it is it diet for a cow? Is he a carb diet or is it a fat diet? You probably don't realize that cows are almost a hundred percent fat. Because just like you and I, those cows can't break down. Mammals can't break down down grass. We just don't have the ability to do it. The bacteria do. They digest it in one of their multiple stomachs, and they break it down to short-chain fatty acids like acetate, butyrate, and, and propionate. And that gets something. That they're, they're, most of those cows are nutritional ketosis 24-7 if they're eating grass. They're fueled by fat, just like we should be, just like most mammals should be. Uh, so if you, I, the best butter is, is organic. Raw, grass-fed, hard to find, but you know it's certainly worth the effort to find them through your health food stores. Some states it's illegal to sell it, but if don't, but in states that it's not, they, that usually the owners can direct you to the farmers where you can get it. If that's too much a hassle, or it's just you just can't find it, and if you're forced to get a commercially carry gold butter in the grocery store, is probably the best one out there. Uh, and then tallow and lard. Okay, this is the one I wanted to get to. This is the important side. This is the take home. This is the bullet that you got to know this like the back of your hand because your life depends on it. It really does. You have to have DHA. DHA is a 22 carbon omega-3 fat. And I want to finish up on the flax because I'm not finished with it. Flax is ALA. It's an 18 carbon fat. And you need some, I said, as I said. I take a tablespoon. It's not a lot. It's 15 grams, half an ounce. But people taking that believe that their body's going to somehow magically convert that to DHA. DHA is where the money is. It really is. That's your half of your brain is DHA. But your body only converts like less than depends on which study you look at. It's definitely less than five percent, and it's probably less than one percent. It converts more of it to EPA, which is a twenty carbon ch chain fat. But the, the conversion to DHA is abysmally poor. You're just not going to get the DHA. So how do you get the DHA? Fish oil supplements or krill, right? Right? No. I'm not here to sell you krill. I don't take krill. I get my DHA from seafood. There's something magical in seafood, healthy seafood, very short of lived ones, uh, let me go. like sardines, anchovies, herring, fish roe, or Alaskan salmon. Those are some examples. Oysters would be other ones. Healthy shrimp from Alaska. Oh, don't I just finished reading this book called Fake Foods. I mean, Charlie mentioned it in his intro. I don't know if we were referring to the book or just just a term. But there's a book, Fake Foods. It was just written about two months ago, and. Um, he exposed it. I think we've written on our site too. You do, do, do not ever want to eat shrimp in a restaurant or buy it unless you know where they took it from. Like maybe the Gulf or something. But most of it comes from th Thailand and it's they're, they're grown in these toxic. It's just it's just poison. I love shrimp, but I, I won't buy it in a restaurant. So these are the f foods, and you don't need a lot. You only need like you don't need to have a half a out a half a pound of salmon a day. You probably only need between two and three ounces. That's it of any of these, or a can of sardines, you know. And you know how do you make sardines taste good? You just put them in a salad. You mix them up and put some other flavorful ingredients in there. But this is where you get the DHA from. When you process it in fish oil or even krill, it probably has some benefit. There's no question there's some benefit. But it's not going to be as good as eating it from food. And there's some magic that will occur that I don't have time to go into now, but I will in my question and answer session. Of what happens of the connection between the reason that Einstein got his Nobel Prize in 1921 has to do with how DHA interacts with sunlight. And I'll explain that in the afternoon. You know, um, 
Um, I kind of lost track of time, so how much time do I have? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? 12? Okay, that's good. All right, so this is a sample of my diet, about 80% fat, 8% protein, 7% fiber, and 4% carbs, net carbs. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but I think most of us need to eat at least half of our diet as fat, healthy fat, as we're having omega-6 oxidized oils, industrially processed, that's probably going to get you sicker. It has to be from the fats that we just, I just mentioned. Now, to help you implement this type of program, because you have no clue, how are you going to figure this stuff out? Well, there is a program, it's online, it's Chronometer, and actually the best version is chronometer.com. Write this down, slash Mercola. It's free. The desktop version is free. It, and it, it is a commitment. It's going to take a few hours to actually implement it, so you know, don't do it if you're overwhelmed. But if you really have a health problem, and, and you know, I've, I've, I've started this approach to help people, those 1,600 people who are dying every day in the United States, in the, every day, they need a resource to stop them from dying. And this is what it is. So it's, an, it's, it's the, clearly the best nutrient tracker on the market. There's nothing that even comes close. I've looked at them all. That's why I worked with the founder of this to help, because it's specifically designed for nutritional ketosis. And it's accurate data, and it's great. Oops. Oh, how did that happen? I have a technical glitch. Sorry about that. And it's not showing on that, but... Somehow... Okay, here we go. Let's see it. No. I think I got it now. Okay. All right. So, would you like an example of what some foods look look like on this diet program? Look, what, how about this? Is my salad that I have pretty much every day, except when I'm traveling to Reno. Although it's interesting. Yesterday, I was traveling. They served us a chicken salad on the plane, and I took out the chicken. I brought out my mixing bowl, which is about this big, and I poured in like this many sunflower seed sprouts, <laughs> took out my avocado, cut it up, and put in my anchovies. And everyone was looking at me like I was weird or something. But you can, you can eat healthy even on a plane. Uh, so fennel, fermented vegetables, these are things I put in my salad. You can mix it up. The beautiful thing about a salad is, is it's really, you know, the, I have about 25 grams of protein. Not all of those, one of those I have typically as a primary source. And most of these, in fact, all of these foods I grow in my garden. Because I live in Florida, so I can do that. This is the fat bomb I have every day. I had it this morning. I usually travel with about, if I'm, I'm going for a week now, because I'm going to Chicago after this, so I've got like, I think I packed 15 avocados, or maybe 20. So I can have my three avocados a day. Because it's hard to find when you're like, here, how are you going to find an avocado when you're in this hotel, right? I guess you could order from room service, but they'd probably charge you $10 for it. Uh, so th th this is about an 85% fat. This, this specific one has 110 grams of, of that. And the stevia makes it taste really good. And I put some mitochondrial nutrients in it. Peak fasting is another powerful intervention that will activate all the, those, the AMPK and will tend to downregulate uh, mTOR. It's intermittent fasting, and almost everyone in this room would benefit from doing it. What's the worst time to eat? When? Who said before bed? Gold star. That's it. That is it. Why? Because you're dumping fuel in when you don't need it, right? It's just the absolute worst time. I typically don't eat. My last meal is about five to six hours before I go to sleep. So I, I typically eat pretty quick within an hour of getting up, and I'm fasting for about 15 hours. I do that most of the time. Uh, and it's, so you eat, for, so you eat for 6 to 11 hours. And just the simple fact of scheduling the timing of your, your food is going to have a dramatic impact on your health. That would totally change these metabolic pathways. It's like almost magic. 
So you can not even... This is totally independent of what I've just been telling you about, about the fats and nutritional ketosis. They're two separate, and they work like powerful synergy, synergies, as does sunlight exposure. Actually, we ought to talk about that. Okay. Now, this is a picture of me in high school. I had some hair. Yeah. It's what I might tell you about exercise, which increases mitochondrial biogenesis. And this is a picture of a patient that I had, one of the last patients I had, who had... Uh, a pituitary tumor that caused Cushing's disease, not syndrome. And I uh, went to University of Chicago before seeing me. He had uh, the sur- university. It's a teaching institution, you know. So they had the, sur- the neurosurgical resident, or the, neuro- no, the anesthesia resident, kind of messed up, and uh, as a result, he had thoracic spinal injury, and he was like uh, paralyzed from the waist down. But then the neurosurgical resident slipped in the surgery, severed his optic nerve, so he's also blind. But you know what impressed me about this guy's name's Jeff? You know what impressed me about him? He was still exercising. So I figure if Jeff can exercise, what's our excuse? So I rarely go to conferences and, and actually attend them. I really do. I'm just so busy doing other things. I'm going to actually go to one in two weeks, or I'm going to be attending the whole thing just like this. Not quite as big. It's going to be on conquering cancer, top cancer experts in the world. It's one of my new passions. But I can guarantee you, I will not be sitting down. I'll be standing up most of the time, in the back of the room probably. Because sitting is the new smoking. It's a very, in fact, it probably is more dangerous than smoking to your health. I had chronic debilitating back pain, seeing dozens of chiropractors, did inversion tables, strength strength training, stretches, yoga, you name it, and I never got better until I stopped sitting. Now, I could, I, I could, I'd be in pain if I did this like a few years ago, but now I'm, there's no pain at all. I could sit on planes and it's not a problem. So you gotta, you gotta move. And it's not just so much standing, because when you're standing, if you stand like this every day, it's probably just as bad as sitting. But when you're standing, you're moving. And your body wants to move. It's designed to move. You should be moving like continuously. Unfortunately, if most of you are practicing dentists, you're doing that. You're not, you don't have a sitting job. But you know, you have to explain it to your patients. So it exercise, it, it, it actually decreases cancer risk. Uh, all these cancers go down. And it probably does it through uh, some metabolic pathways that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Other important factors, I've written a book that really summarizes many of them. It's, it was a good one, but it's not going to be as good as a new one that I just, I'm writing now, I'm finishing. Then I'm going to talk about things like this. We all know about vitamin D, right? I mean, I was one of the first to, to beat the band on that in the, around 2000 and actually catalyzed the acceptance of the, that in the conventional medical system where now almost regular doctors are measuring vitamin D levels. But they never got the message. They only heard part of it. You're not supposed to swallow vitamin D. I haven't swallowed vitamin D for eight years. My level is 70. Because I walk shirtless on the beach for two to three hours a day. That's the way we're designed to absorb it. What's the danger of getting vitamin D orally? It's a steroid hormone. It is not a vitamin. And most of us here don't understand that vitamin D is a surrogate marker for you ultraviolet B radiation exposure, which has profound benefits metabolically far beyond the generation of vitamin D and the conversion of your skin. And when you fake out your body with oral vitamin D, it, you're saying, hey, I got plenty of UVB. It has no clue. It's, it, it can't figure it out. It was never designed to be swallowing vitamin D in those doses. And you cause metabolic havoc. You need to get it from ultraviolet B. Ideally, the sun is the best source. Tanning beds are poor second because it's not balanced with the infrared. You need the infrared to balance the dangers to repair regenerative mechanisms. So that is your goal. And I know, I get it. The, the strong minority of you here are simply unable to do it. And you can't change. You're committed to your practice. You live in areas where 
less than half the time of the year there's enough UVB out there to get. And the other half the time you're working inside with your patients. So it's a bad thing. Now, did I say don't take vitamin D? No. I, if I was in that situation, I'd probably do it. I would probably take it. Or actually, I would get a healthy tanning tanny bed. Can't get ours because the FTC fined me a million dollars for selling tanning beds and telling people this, telling them this information. We had to stop selling tanning beds last year because of the FTC. This is another thing that I would like to talk about more this afternoon. This is a really, really important slide. And it, you don't have it in your handouts because I just found it this morning. <laughs> they always ask for my slides like a week before. I says, I'm making the slides up when I'm coming. You know, it's like, it's really important because I'm learning stuff all the time. The first one is daylight. That is a spectral frequency of daylight which also has a CRI color rendition index of 100. That is health. Most of us are not, are severely compromised in health, totally jeopardize our ability to reach our biological longevity maximum of 120, which could be expanded to maybe 220 with technology in the future, like CRISPR-Cas9 and stem cells and a whole variety of other components. But you'll never get there if you don't access these basic things of photobiology. Now here, the next one you're seeing is I just don't have a lot of time to expand on this, but is, is the incandescent bulb, which you know are in the process this year of finally being banned for sale in the United States. One of the absolute worst decisions ever made in health in the country. Great for energy. 5% of an incandescent bulb goes out as light. 95% goes out as heat. Everyone thought the heat was useless. It was dangerous. It was unnecessary. Not dangerous. It was unnecessary. Far from it. It has enormous health producing benefits. So right infrared sauna is healthy. It's infrared radiation. You need it. It's health. When you... So that's... The key point here is, while you can, there's probably... You won't be able to do it next year. Grab some incandescent light bulbs if you don't have them already. Get the clear ones. You want the clear ones, not the ones that are coated with the white phosphors to make a cool white. You want the warm white, that's the 2700 degree Kelvin light. And that has that wavelength. They notice how low it is uh, in the blue. It's really low, right? So it's not a great light to be exposed to in the daytime. But at night, the last thing in the world you ever want to do is be exposed to blue light. And we all know that. Know that this is not controversial, bless you. No one's going to, this is not, because Everyone here has a phone, right? And that phone has either iOS or it has Android. And on that, and, and if you've got the latest operating system, that iOS version 9 on upwards has got nightshade. And Android in the latest version, version 6, has daylight or blue, blo blue, blue light blocker. They know at night you don't need blue light exposure. But what are we doing? Look at that. What is, I can't, I can't see it from here with its glasses on. It's, oh, the cool white bulbs. Oh. Oh, yeah, the bottom middle one is the color cool white LED. This is one of your most toxic exposures. We all know that EMFs, non-native EMF exposures are dangerous. The most dangerous non-native EMF, unopposed blue light from artificial light, which is why I'm wearing these glasses. Because you've got a peak right there high. Now it's not as dangerous in the daytime because you're designed to have some, but when you could continuously look at this through indoor artificial LED lighting with no there's no red and infrared. Look at the look at that graph. It just disappears. You're getting unopposed. It's a little better with the warm LEDs. So if you're gonna have if you're gonna have insist on LEDs for energy savings in your office or wherever, at least make them warm. Do not get the cool white. Very dangerous. And I can guarantee you, I assure you, there, I don't think I'll be able to change the constant system of the healthcare system in the next 10 or 20 years on this t topic. Possibly. But I don't think so. And as a result, I predict, and I've been pretty damn good with my predictions on when it comes to health, that there will be an epidemic of age-related macular degeneration. Blindness. It is now the current most common cause of blindness in the United States. And you are at high risk if you don't guard yourself from this. I was at high risk. I had at home an LED monitor. Remember, I'm, I'm, I'm a content guy. I'm on the computer 16 hours a day. I was sitting down 16 hours a day. That's why I got back pain. I don't sit down anymore. Stand up, but I still, I had a 55-inch monitor as my monitor. 
LED and I'm sitting like this far away from it with the full color intensity, you know, 4K color intensity, I had no idea it was so toxic and dangerous. So you got to guard yourself. So fortunately, there are programs like Flux or blue, artificial blue light blockers. Now, these are expensive. They, they, they sell them on Amazon. You have to budget. I know you're going to be donating to our cause, so you might not be able to afford them, but these are $9. So you can buy them on Amazon for $9. These are not the same ones. I've actually wore them on the plane up. These are a little, this is a little more because I'm presenting in front of a few hundred people, so I thought I wouldn't wear these. These are a little bit different, but they're called Uvex. And I would get one for everyone in your family. Because when the sun goes down, you were not really designed to be exposed to light, unless it was a thermal light source, like candles or a fire. And if you think about it, what is an incandescent light? It's a thermal light source. That's why its spectrum is so similar to the sun, except for the blue light, which is good because you don't want blue light exposure at night. This is, it's like the perfect light. But even then, when the sunlight goes down, you shouldn't have any lights on. And ideally, if you do, you have the blue light blockers on at a minimum. But this the next step is that virtually no one understands now and because of the photobiology consequences, except for a few just brilliant European investigators, the damage that's being done. I mean, this is well substantiated in animal studies. This is just unequivocal. This is non-controversial. It causes damage. It causes serious damage, so it, specifically in the retinal pigment epithelium, the RPE. So that's why you want to wear these things. I think I mentioned all those things. Oh, efflux is something you could, for any operating system, it works. Just to give you a little hint, um, it will block the blue light, but by default, it, it, see, everyone believes that you only need to block the blue light at night, so, but you don't, they don't understand that it's important to block in the daytime. Now, it's in rooms like this, now, if there was a giant wall of windows there, I would take these glasses off, because I'm being balanced. Is that it? We gotta go? Is that it? Okay, all right.